Ask someone who was born after 1970 who Hermann Hesse is, and you might just get a blank stare or a look of puzzlement or a vague, oh yeah, um, I've heard that name before. But if you ask someone who was born around 1940, you're going to get a completely different kind of response, particularly if that person happened to have gone through a phase of flower power hippiedom in their youth, then they're going to know who Hermann Hesse is. You might ask them that question and you get that far away look in their eyes like they're remembering those distant days of rock and roll concerts, drugs, free sex, etc, etc, and reading, reading books like Timothy Leary, Abby Hoffman, and yes, Hermann Hesse. Yes, the hippies loved Hermann Hesse. They loved to read him. Why did the hippies love Hermann Hesse? With their urge to experiment in alternative lifestyles, with mind-altering chemicals, with um, alternative and innovative social relationships. And there you have this strange, sort of slightly austere, slightly Calvinist um, writer um, but there was something about him that they picked up on. It could have been his spiritualism, it could have been his anti-war stance, it could have been his political quietism, I'll say more about that later. Um, it could have been his vague general humanist view of the world. We're going to find out. So who was Hermann Hesse? He was the same generation as Thomas Mann. He was born in 1877 in a small town called Kalv, not far from Stuttgart, in the northern Black Forest. That's where he spent his childhood. I guess you could say he came from a middle-class family too, just like Thomas Mann. His father was a missionary, which kind of makes him a member of the middle class. There was a time when the clergy was called the first estate alongside the nobility and the commoners that was in the days of the kings but by the time we get to Hermann Hesse's time um, if you're a missionary you or a preacher you are more or less in the middle class why am I talking about the middle class all the time well I think you know by now Hesse's parents had been active with the Basel mission in India, and in fact his mother was born there. And this may account for some of his fascination with the East. We don't see this fascination in any of the texts we're reading this week, but consider this. In 1911, Hesse took a trip to India, partly in search of respite from a difficult relationship, but partly also in search of some kind of a spiritual awakening, which he thought he might find there. And this search for a spiritual rejuvenation in the East was something that stayed with him his whole life long. And remember this quest for spiritual rejuvenation because this was another thing which was going to endear him to the generation born around 1940. Remember the Beatles' legendary trip to India? That's just one example among many. And if you do yoga, um, then you can thank the revival or the introduction of widespread yoga to the West to this fascination with Eastern traditions which started to grow around the 60s and 70s. When Hesse came back from India, he published a journal which he called Ours Indian, Out of India, published in 1913. It was kind of a travelogue, kind of notes of his journey, and he attached a few poems to it as well, including a poem, Im Urwald, in the jungle, where he wrote the following lines. Strange is the song, and not a word's familiar, and yet I find it no different from back home on the Rhine or Necker, when an evening song from fishers or maids sounds out. I breathe fear and breathe longing, and the wild forest and strange dark stream is like a home to me. For here, as everywhere where there are people, apprehensive souls approach their gods 
imploring the night's terror in a song. And as he sailed back to Europe through the Suez Canal, and he noticed that he got into the Mediterranean and it was getting cooler and rainier and Europe's weather was approaching, he thought back to those hot days and hot beaches in India, and he commented. He wrote that his memories of glowing days and hot coastlines would never be as precious to him as the strong feeling of unity and close kinship of all human beings, a feeling I acquired among the Indians, Malaysians, Chinese, and Japanese. And this is what I call Hesse's humanism. Later, in 1922, he would write a novel called Siddhartha, which is the first name of the Buddha. And there was a film version of this book made in 1972, and here we are back in the generation born around 1940. If you know Hesse's books, you'll know that childhood was a particularly intense period for him, and his experiences of childhood stayed with him throughout his whole life. He kept returning to childhood again and again in his books. In um, the short story that we read, The Interrupted Class, um, it was written in um, 1948. Hesse was 71 years old, but still he wanted to hold on to a memory of a specific incident um, in his childhood. And it's a curious incident. It's an unresolved incident. Uh, it's an incident where the protagonist hedges between what he thinks he ought to do and what he thinks he might like to do, the strictures of authority and the desire to break out of authority. Again, very important in all of Hesse's writing. His first two novels also dealt with themes similar in childhood. One, um, Peter Kamenzind, the name of the protagonist, published in 1904, and then the second one, Under the Wheel, published in 1906. Both of these deal with the difficulty of growing up in an adult world where you're being forced more and more into conformity with that world, but at the same time trying to hold on to the magic of childhood. And Hesse took this magic really seriously. Peter Kamenzin begins with the lines. In the beginning there was myth. Just as the great god poeticized and struggled for expression in the souls of the Indians, Greeks, and old Germans, this god poeticizes every day anew in the soul of each and every child. Hesse's child protagonists all have something in common. They all rebel, they struggle against bourgeois conformity, they struggle against authoritarianism, and they go in search of some kind of awakening, whether it be a spiritual awakening, a self-realization, an artistic awakening, but it's always that something that pulls them away from what they regard as the fake and sham and superficial world of the adults. And thinking back to Thomas Mann, we could also add the sham, fake world of bourgeois morality, of middle-class morality. This rebellion grew out of Hesse's own experiences. When he was going to school, he was an extremely rebellious child, um, not only in school, but also against his parents. I mean, what teenager doesn't rebel against their parents, but he was also depressive and sometimes even suicidal. And he moved from school to school and he was in and out of mental institutions. In one of them, he actually tried to shoot himself. And when he finally got to the upper grades in high school, he only did one year and then he left. And he left to train as an apprentice in uh, the bookseller's trade. And he spent a few years working as a bookseller in um, the town of Tübingen and also in Basel in Switzerland. Um, but when the two novels that I just mentioned were published, Peter Kamenzind and Under the Wheel, 
Then he suddenly was quite successful and he could earn a living writing and he gave up his career and he was a writer for the rest of his life. In 1914, the First World War broke out and Hesse joined so many writers and intellectuals in welcoming this war, in rejoicing, in greeting it positively. This was going to be the war to end all wars. And so many young men immediately signed up and went to the front. It wasn't very long before these young men were extremely disillusioned if they survived. A lot of them didn't. Many very promising young artists and writers died in the trenches in the First World War. Hesse wasn't one of them because he was deemed unfit to serve and so he never joined the army. But his enthusiasm for the First World War also did not last for very long. And we are reading a short piece where we can see his views of the First World War written in 1917 if the war goes on for another two years. It's kind of a near future dystopian um, story and we can see the strong rejection of the violence of the war, of the technology of war, um, but we also see the futility of war. We see the damage that it does to life and the damage that it does to interpersonal relationships, a kind of bureaucratization of interpersonal relationships where life becomes reduced to nothing but numbers and interactions with petty bureaucrats. And note how the narrator responds. Ever since I was a boy, I have been in the habit of disappearing now and then to restore myself by immersion in other worlds. My friends would look for me and after a time write me off as missing. When I finally returned, it always amused me to hear what so-called scientists had to say of my absences or twilight states. Though I did nothing but what was second nature to me and what sooner or later most people will be able to do, those strange beings regarded me as a kind of freak. Some thought me possessed, others endowed me with miraculous powers. So now, once again, I vanished for a time. The present had lost its charm for me after two or three years of war, and I slipped away to breathe different air. I left the plane on which we live and went to live on another plane. Now this is absolutely typical for Hesse. This withdrawal into a spiritualism, into a quietism, into another plane, into another way of looking at life that wants to remove him from the sphere of the political altogether. Is that possible? Can anyone ever completely step out of the sphere of the political? Well, you make up your own mind, but this is the question that Hesse poses us. So when the First World War broke out, Hesse had already published an appeal, a public appeal to German intellectuals, asking them not to fall prey to the nationalist tendencies that seemed to be taking over everybody in Germany at the time. Because already in 1914, he was seeing the potential damage of going to wide-scale war. And he was quite surprised to find the public reaction to this. It involved hate mail, it involved rejection from the press, it involved alienation from many of his friends, include, including Thomas Mann. Um, Thomas Mann kind of found his way back into the friendship later, but for the moment they parted ways. So by the time the war was over and Europe started filling up with images of mutilated, damaged, psychologically damaged, traumatized soldiers coming back from the front, Hesse was already a vociferous opponent of military service and he started advocating against conscription. And again, fast forward to the 1960s and the 1970s. This was the time of the Vietnam War. It was the time of conscription in the United States. 
the time of mass anti-war protests and burning of draft cards, and when many young American men left the United States and came to Canada to settle, where there was no military conscription. And in Hesse's 1919 novel Damien, we read passages about how any hopes for humane behavior are buried beneath the ravages of war. In that same year, 1919, Hesse moved to Ticino in the Italian part of Switzerland, and that's where he lived until his death in 1962. When the Nazis started to gain power in the early 1930s, Hesse's political quietism went in a couple of different directions. On the one hand, he started to become very dismayed with human civilization and human history in general. And on the other hand, he started to speak out in certain respects against the Nazis. He spoke out in favor of um, some of the Jewish authors who were being persecuted by the Nazis. And um, it got to the point where um, no German newspapers would actually publish any articles by him at all, because he'd been writing in the German newspapers from the safety of Switzerland, neutral Switzerland. Um, however, the Germans uh, started to see him as a risky voice, and one that they didn't necessarily want to promote. But still, he wrote the lines, I don't believe in many things that are the pride of humankind today. I don't believe in technology. I don't believe in the magnificence and unsurpassability of our age. I don't believe in a well-paid Führer. But I have unlimited respect for what they call nature. In 1932, he wrote what many people considered to be his masterpiece, The Glass Bead Game. And in it, he plays on the contrast between a life of intellectual pursuit, but also austerity and withdrawal from the busy life of the outside world, a, li um, a, a, a pursuit of spiritualism and, and ritualism, a kind of a community of scholars withdrawn from the world, that on the one hand. And then on the other hand, the need to actually go out into the world and live life and experience love and sex and debauchery and gambling and um, living on the edge and all of these things that in certain respects make life livable and make life worth trying out. Um, two completely different ways of approaching life, which Hesse was, um, he, he was fascinated his whole lifelong by the tension between these, the mystic, the intellectual, the spiritualist on the one hand, withdrawing from the world, and then the adventurer going out into the world, the businessman, the libertine going out into the world, trying out life. How do you combine these two ways of living life? Is there a middle ground? This is a another one of the big questions that Hesse leaves us with in his writings. And maybe this tension, this split between different approaches to life also formed his politics. Maybe it also formed how he responded to war and to fascism. It's possible. It's not entirely clear, but it's possible. We would certainly expect it. He responded to injustice, he responded to what he saw was wrong with the world, but he did not believe that a solution to the wrongs of the world was to be found on a political level. He believed it was to be found on an artistic, intellectual, transcendental, spiritual level, a kind of a renewal of humanity from within, not through reinforcing authoritarian structures, which is what he thought politics did, but through a reawakening of spirituality. And as a result, his political voice is much softer than his spiritual voice. It's the spiritual voice which dominates in his work. And we see this really clearly in 
another short piece which we read this week. And that was an, an exchange of letters between um, Max Brod and Hesse. Max Brod, the famous Max Brod, friend of Franz Kafka. In fact, it was Max Brod who had been tasked with the burning of Kafka's works after Kafka died. Brod did not do that. And today we can read Kafka's works. But in 1948, Max Brod was just about to board ship from Genoa, sailing to Palestine. Um, it was May 1948, and he was concerned about the future of the state of Israel. This brand new state of Israel, which had just been declared the previous week, and the day after Ben-Gurion had declared the founding of the State of Israel, um, there was a collection of armies, Egyptian, Syrian, Jordanian, and Iraqi armies, which moved into Palestine um, with the intention, they said, of preventing bloodshed. The, Israel, the Israelis were accusing them of invading, and Max Brod um, certainly saw it that way as well. In fact, we see in the letter that he expresses the fear to Hesse that these invading armies are going to destroy everything that civilization has achieved. They're going to, uh, they're going to destroy the settlements, the work of generations, as Brod says, and they're going to also threaten the artifacts of civilization. For example, Brod mentions Kafka's manuscripts and Novalis's manuscripts, the great German romantic poet Novalis. But look how Hesse responds. He speaks of the power of the ministers and the policy makers, and then he writes, they have their house rules that cover them and perhaps make their responsibility more bearable. We, guardians of the spiritual substance, we servants of the word and of truth, watch them with as much pity as horror. But our house rules, we believe, are more than house rules. They are true commandments, eternal and divine laws. Our mission is to safeguard them, and we endanger that mission with every compromise, we endanger it every time we agree, even with the noblest intentions, to play by their rules. So what do you think? This is an open question. Is humanity's future to be entrusted to the politicians, the ministers and the policy makers, or is it to be entrusted to the spiritualists? Or is there some middle ground, some combination? Hesse has left us with this question. <laughs>